Good morning. Our scripture reading today is Genesis chapter 4. It can be found in most of the Pew Bibles, I believe, on page 3. And bear with me, we were joking about it earlier that there's approximately 16 names in here, some of them that I'm not very familiar with, so I might stumble on them, but we'll give it a whirl. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offerings. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain lay with his wife and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city and he named it after his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad. Irad was the father of Mahushael, and Mahushael was the father of Methushael, and Methushael was the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women, one named Ada and the other Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who lived in tents and raised livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who played the harp and flute. Zillah also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all, I'm sorry, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was ne- Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my word. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. Adam lay with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Zeth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. Zeth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. At that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. I feel like we should give a standing ovation for that reading. It was so good, Karen. Let's pray. God, as we sit here now waiting to hear from you, we pray that you would speak to us in a way that we can understand through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Lately, my favorite day of the week is Wednesday because on Wednesday nights, 
Meg and I are hosting a group in our home called Alpha. Alpha is an exploration of the Christian faith. Um, questions like, who is Jesus? Why did Jesus die? And some people come who are Christians already. Some people come who are not Christians. And some aren't sure what they believe. So as you can imagine, we have some good discussions on Wednesday nights in our house. And just last Wednesday, we were talking about sin. What is sin? Is there such a thing as sin? Uh, Why did Jesus die for sin? Those are all the questions that Genesis 4 points us toward. Genesis 4 is all about sin. Now, last week, we heard the story of Adam and Eve rebelling against God, eating the fruit that was forbidden, listening to the serpent who told them not to trust God, and for that, they lost their communion with God and each other in the garden. God said to the serpent in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. Um, He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And those words started a war between good and evil, a war between the those that side with the serpent and those that side with God. What this chapter tells us is that that war is fought in the battleground of your heart and of my heart. Every person is a battleground in the war between good and evil, between God's way and sin. And so this chapter tells us Four things that we need to know about sin. First, what sin is, what sin demands, where sin leads, and finally, there's hope for the sinner. So what sin is, what it demands, where it leads, and where there's hope. First, it shows us what sin is, and it tells us through the story of Cain and Abel. I'm not going to read it verse by verse, but you've just heard it read. Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain and Abel. Many years go by, and eventually these two brothers are bringing an offering to the Lord. Abel is a shepherd and brings some of the, the best of his flock. Abel's a farmer and brings some produce as an offering. There's nothing wrong with produce. It, Deuteronomy and other books of the Bible say that those are acceptable offerings. Um, But we're led into the condition of Cain's heart. You can see by his reaction when God doesn't accept his offering, um, what's in his heart. It says Cain was very angry. His face was downcast. He was sulking and feeling sorry for himself and feeling jealous toward his brother and angry toward his brother. And that actually revealed his reaction to God's um, uh, assessment of his offering, revealed what was in his heart all along. Kind of like how sometimes I will do something nice for Meg, you know, watch the kids for a little extra time, but then if she doesn't notice it and thank me for it, I get annoyed at her. <laughs> Say, I get angry and downcast. It probably means that I wasn't doing it for the right reason to begin with. Well, God tries to reason with Cain. He, he says, why are you angry? In verse 6, why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. The Lord is assuming that Cain has a choice to make, isn't he? He's saying, I mean, why else would he talk to him if Cain was just a victim of these forces in his life? Cain has a choice to make about his sin. God says, it's not too late, Cain. You can still choose to do what is right. You can resist those sinful desires inside you and say no to them. But if you don't, they will overpower you. That's the, that's the battle. That's the war. 
And tragically, Cain doesn't listen to God. It's interesting how in Genesis 3, the serpent has to talk Eve into sinning. And now God is trying to talk Cain out of sinning, but he still doesn't listen. We know what happens. He lures his brother to the field and he murders him. I wonder, did he hit him with a tool or, or a rock or beat him to death? It doesn't tell us, but maybe we are desensitized to sin because we see it every day. But we need to see just how awful this is, just how tragic it is that there's even such a thing as death in the world. But the first death was someone being murdered at the hands of his own brother. That was the first death in this world, and that shows you the downward slide of sin. That shows you how evil and how bad it is. In only one generation, humans have gone from paradise to murdering their own brother. But Cain's sin doesn't end there because when God confronts him and asks, where is your brother? He says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? He's defensive and deceptive. So let's do an instant replay of Cain's choices through this whole little account. Sinful desires begin to grow in him. And then he chooses to nurture those desires. And then even though God tries to persuade him otherwise, he chooses to act on those desires. And then when confronted, he chooses to cover up his actions. This teaches us what sin is. It's a choice. Sin, well, it's both a choice that starts in you, and then it's a force that overpowers you. You see that? But the power of sin can't overcome you unless you make that choice to give in to it, right? God tells Cain, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. In my mind, that means Cain actually had a choice to make. And friends, that fits with my personal experience. Does it fit with yours? When I'm contemplating doing something that I know is wrong, there's a moment of decision. When I either continue on or I, I choose to resist and to try to master those desires. There's a moment when I say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give in to this anger and be angry with my kids right now because I have to be, I can't help it. Or I take a step back and say, no, I'm not going to let those desires rule over me. Sometimes it's only a millisecond of a choice, but there's a choice there. And then you find that after you make that choice, the sin becomes overwhelming and you feel like you can't escape it. But the power of sin cannot do that to you unless you choose to, uh, to follow it. Like a, a wild animal crouching at your door. It's not going to hurt you unless you go out of your door and get in its path, right? I wonder what Cain would have said in his defense. He would say, but it's not fair that you liked Abel's offering more than mine, uh, but I was too angry to help it. Uh, I, I just couldn't help myself, or, or that's just the way I am, God. That person made me too angry. We say the same kinds of things to ourselves, right? They made me so angry. Actually, you, you chose to be angry based on what was in your heart. Sin is a choice, and once you choose it, it it's a power that takes over. And that is the battle going on in your heart. That's, that's the battle being fought every day in each one of our hearts, the battle over sin. Well, that's what sin is, and then we move into what sin demands. We see God handing down a sentence to Cain as a natural consequence. He says that Cain will have to leave um, God's presence, that the ground that Abel's blood was spilled on will no longer yield its crops to Cain, so Cain becomes a wanderer, a nomad, um, 
I'm actually surprised that God didn't demand Cain's life in payment for Abel's life, but God is merciful. And God's judgment is mixed with mercy. He puts a mark on Cain to to even protect him so that others won't harm him. But there's one thing that God says in this section that I want to focus on. I want you to notice. It's in verse 10. God says this, Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. What a stirring picture that is. What, what an image. Abel's blood has a voice, so to speak. And, and what is it saying? It's saying, justice. I, I, there must be justice for this innocent uh, blood. God can hear that cry. Because, because all sin demands justice. And if it weren't that way... Um, <laughs> God wouldn't be good, right? It's comforting to know that, that all the evil things that happen in this world, God is keeping an account of, and he's, there's going to be a reckoning someday for all the evil and all the pain that's inflicted on people. I, th- I think the more that you've experienced injustice, the, the better news that is for you. I imagine the, the families in Syria who have lost their children or their lives to airstrikes or to... ISIS. I think of uh, families in South America terrorized by drug cartels who, whose mem- family members are kidnapped and extorted for money. I think even of the millions, yeah, millions of Christians around the world who are persecuted, even today, because of their belief in Jesus. And for all of these people, and for you, if you've ever had injustice committed against you, It is good news that God can hear the cries of that blood coming up to him, that he's keeping track as sin demands justice. But that's also scary news for us, isn't it? Because we're not just the victims, we're also the sinners. We've done things to other people that have hurt them. We've committed things that are ultimately against God that hurt Him. And our sin demands justice as well. We can't say it's only those people who do those things that deserve God's justice. It has to be all or nothing. And our sin demands justice as well. I want to tell you a story about a person who who knew this firsthand, who really um, spent a lot of time thinking about the line between good and evil. His name was Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And during World War II, he fought in Russia's Red Army as an officer. He was a devoted, idealistic member of the Communist Party. After the war, when Stalin came to power and the Soviet Union began to form, um, Solzhenitsyn began to have uh, a shift in thinking because he saw the Injustices being done by the Russian, uh, by the Soviet Union. He saw six million Ukrainians starving because of um, poverty ba- triggered by uh, corruption and oppression. He began to be disillusioned with the Communist Party and to speak out against Stalin. And as you can guess, for his criticism, he was put in a Russian gulag for eight years where he was tortured. He was dehumanized. He, was, uh, he suffered greatly at the hands of the, the party that he once belonged to. Well, during his time in prison, if things couldn't get worse, the seventh year of his sentence, he, he developed um, cancer. And he underwent an emergency surgery in prison, an emergency operation. One of the doctors attending on him was a Christian. And this man one night shared with him all about his conversion from Judaism to Christianity. And Solzhenitsyn was listening. The next morning, though, this this doctor was found murdered in his bed. Uh, You know, being a Christian made you a target in in the Soviet Union. And so all of these things that, that Alexander Solzhenitsyn had experienced 
was drawing his heart toward God. And during his last year in the gulag, he himself encountered Jesus and became a Christian. He was released the same year that Stalin died, and he went on to be a writer. He actually lived in Cavendish, Vermont for about 10 years, um, writing in exile. But he, he became a writer documenting the failures of the Soviet Union and, and, and really contributing to the fall of communism in, in Russia. And here is one thing that he wrote based on his time in that Russian gulag. He said, If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? The war between good and evil and the line between good and evil is not between us and them, whoever you want to call them. It's not between good people and bad people. It's fought in the territory of of each of us, inside our hearts, inside our wills, inside our choices. That's the battle. Sin demands justice. We want justice for things done against us, but it can't be one-sided. All sin demands justice, including our own, right? Well, the next section tells us where sin leads. Cain's choice to sin has taken him out of God's plan. It's disqualified him from being part of the solution, being part of the, the right side of this war. Um, and the word, the, the place where he settles is called Nod, which means wandering. He's kind of a spiritually homeless person now. Uh, and I find it really interesting that the author takes time to describe Cain's children and their children and all their accomplishments. Um, and there are actually some redeeming things about his family's life. I mean, the arts begin to flourish and agriculture and metalworking all came from Cain's descendants. These are good things. Um, but life outside of God's plan also has a darker side. And by the seventh generation from Adam, that number seven says, hey, look at this. The seventh generation from Adam, we get to Lamech. Lamech is a bad dude. He says he married two wives, two women. The first person of many, to depart from God's plan in the garden. And not only that, but he's he's boastful and violent. He says, um, I have wounded, I have killed a man for wounding me and um, killed a man for harming me. If Cain is avenged seven times, Lamech is avenged 77 times. He's boasting in his violence. We've gone from Cain who murders his brother out of jealousy to someone who actually boasts in his murdering. Uh, Cain is kind of this self-made man. He says, I don't need God's protection. I'm going to avenge myself. That is further, the further downward slide of sin in Cain's family. And that's where sin will lead you. It'll lead you away from God. It will make you think that you can do it on your own and that you can build your own destiny and Um, solve your own problems like Cain's family. But even though you may be doing good things, it's a dead end. It's going to disqualify you from God's purposes. That's where sin leads. But finally, there's hope. There's hope for sinners. Cain's story is, is tragic, isn't it? It's a case study of what happens when a person chooses sin uh, and sides with the serpent in the war against good and evil. Um, And sadly, you don't have to look very far to see Cain's story still being lived today. It happens all around us. People choosing to go their own way, to, to choose their sin rather than God, 
to, to fully give in to their sin. You see the sin passing down from generation to generation, but it's not only them, it's also us. There's Cain's story inside of each one of us. We, we choose to sin. Uh, we've also inherited a sinful nature from our parents who got it from their parents, who got it from their parents all the way back to Adam and Eve. We choose to try to do things our own way. Maybe you wonder if your sin has disqualified you from being of use to God the way Cain's sin disqualified him. But there is hope. I want to tell you, Cain's story does not need to be your story because this was written so that we wouldn't repeat Cain's story, so that we learn and to show us that there's hope that we can actually win this battle against sin. How can we do that? Well, in verse 25, the author gets back to the main thread of the story that he's most excited about. It's the line of the woman who will eventually crush the serpent's head. He said, well, it's not going to be Cain because he's disqualified. It's not going to be Abel for obvious, obvious reasons. Who is this person going to be from this line of the woman? It says that uh, Eve, gave, Eve gave birth to a son named Seth. And the chapter ends on a hopeful note. It says, At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. If you turn to Luke chapter 3, you don't have to, but if you get to Luke chapter 3, you'll find a list of names in, in Jesus Christ's genealogy that traces it from Jesus all the way back to Adam. And the second name on that list is Seth. Luke is saying, this is the guy. Jesus is the one who is in the line of the woman who is going to crush the serpent's head. He's here. And as we read the story of Jesus, that's what Jesus does. He goes to war against evil. He heals, heals people of diseases. He casts out demons. He preaches the good news. But the real victory happens on the cross. When Jesus shed his blood, his innocent blood, to break the power of sin. Right? The author of the book of Hebrews compares Jesus to Abel. He says, Abel was the first righteous person to sh have his blood shed. Jesus was the ultimate righteous person whose blood was shed. But there's a difference. He says in verse uh, chapter 12, verse 24 of Hebrews, you have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You see, Abel died because of Cain's sin, and his blood called out for justice. But Jesus died because of your sin and my sin. And his blood calls out for mercy. Abel's blood calls out for justice against the sinner, but Jesus' blood calls out for mercy against the sinner. That's where the hope is in this passage. It, it locates us, uh, locates our hope in Jesus. Because when, when Jesus went to the cross, he experienced all the justice that all sin has cried out for through the generations, including your sin and my sin. He said, I am doing this for Nancy. I'm doing this for Case. I'm doing this for Fred. I'm doing this for Tyler. He experienced the justice that our sin deserved so that we could get mercy. <laughs> That's where there's hope for sinners. And here's what happens when you get that, when that becomes your story, you experience forgiveness of your sin. It, it changes everything. First, it transforms your battle against sin. Okay? The battle is not the same anymore. You, you're fighting a battle you can't lose because the power of sin has been broken. And yes, it's still a battle. Yes, we need self-control. We need to say no. We need to try to master our sin but we do so 
as forgiven people, as free people. Uh, Sin cannot be your master if you're following Jesus. But second, it makes you humble. When you realize what Jesus has done for you, you can't any longer define yourself in relationship to other people's sin, right? Maybe, maybe you have a next-door neighbor who's Cain himself, maybe a coworker. You think, man, that, that guy is so bad. I am so glad that I am not like that. I'm so much, at least I'm not like that person. But when you get the gospel, you say, no, there but for the grace of God go I. My sin is bad, and Jesus paid for it. There's no superiority. So your life is a battleground. Your heart is a battleground, fought over your sin. And Jesus has won that war for us. So let's run with abandon toward him and and fall on his mercy and define ourselves according to what he's done for us. We're going to take a few moments now for personal prayer. Um, Before we sing the closing hymn, I want you to pause and I want you to think about what God is saying to you right now. Think about Anything in the word that we've just heard is stirring in you. And once God reveals that to you, decide to respond in faith. Maybe it's a sin to confess and repent of. Maybe it's a way that you need to apply the good news of the gospel to your heart. But reflect for a few moments uh, and pray for God's grace to let that change happen in your life. I'm going to be sitting right here in front. If anybody wants to come and have me pray for them, I would love that. Um, And after a few minutes, uh, we'll sing our closing hymn.